Oh, here we go. All right. Excuse me for slight computer issues. I'm not very literate with these computer problems I've been having with PowerPoint. But tonight, we're going to learn about some important issues on growing a lot of dendrobiums. But our main topic tonight is spatulata. So here are some of the important things you need to know. And of course, you folks know that already because you guys are growing orchids. Sunlight is important for all living things. Even we need sunlight. We need water. We need air. So plants also like good humid conditions, especially some of these spatulatas. Provide them with the right temperatures and you have some outstanding plants. So there are about 50 species recorded. It can be found all over, like I mentioned, Java, Philippines, Australia, the Pacific Islands, with the high concentration is always New Guinea and the Solomon Island area. And we'll be looking at quite a few and I'll share some of my own plants. So here's one of my big plants that I got. I've uh, been growing it for a while. Uh, something I purchased from Roy Tokunaga maybe a few years back, uh, George, uh, Greg Scott. So as you can see, this is two spatulata type species crossed together to create this fabulous plant. This is a 4N plant. So the flowers are very large and very spectacular. Uh, kind of finicky grower because of the, the helix, but the mirabellianum makes this uh, coloration with that yellowish green color. And the helix is that mushroom pink color. So you can see the two traits that carry over. The excellent trait of the very stiff inflorescent comes from helix. So light, you want to give your plants sufficient light. Uh, best to grow them in 50 to 60% shade, anywhere from 2,500 to 4,500 foot candles of light. So that's pretty darn bright. Uh, you want to definitely look at your plants to make sure that you have the right coloration in your leaves. I've said that many of times. It's the big indicator. It helps you to grow great orchids, even with other types. So you look at the color, make sure it's a medium green with a little yellowish tinge to it. If your leaves are really dark and you're not providing it enough light. Okay. The only ones you want to have kind of dark green leaves is mainly your Philonopsis. You don't want to give Philonopsis extreme sunlight. Okay. And of course, if you provide too much sunlight for your spatulatas, too quickly, you can burn them. So you want to make sure you put them in a cool area that circulates good airflow to make sure that they don't overheat. So here are some of the species that are key in hybridizing. So there's some of the great foundation builders that created a lot of nice plants. Some that we might have, some are highly awarded, some not so much but there's a reason behind utilizing some of these species, especially these spatulatas, because of their uh, very robust flowers and very nice presentation and vibrant colors that they bring to their hybrids. Okay, and we're gonna be talking about the ones listed here. Antonatum. Antonatum, a nice compact growing plant a lot of you probably have these. They're small, very nice color. As you can see, the presentation of the flowers is, is great. It's almost like a stratiotis, but what it is, is a miniature. Very small in size, nice coloration in the lip. Uh, these ones like extreme temperatures in the range, uh, light, light conditions, excuse me, in the range of 2,000 to 3,000. So it's pretty bright. So same utilizing your 50 to 50 to 60 percent shade cloth. Temperature ranges vary. They can they can stand pretty warm conditions, but like uh, can tolerate more cooler conditions also. So 
So any type of antenatum, you still look at the leaf color to see if you're giving it adequate light. And of course, another indicator, if your plant is blooming well in the location you're growing it, you leave it there. Don't move the plant around unless you know, hey, my plant is not blooming, it's dark green, what's going on, what's wrong? Roy said the thing's supposed to bloom. You provide it a little more light and you'll see a lot of blooms. Okay, these can be found in New Guinea and the adjacent islands. Uh, having issues paging down again. Stop. Yeah. Seems like it's stuck, Brad. Yep, oh, there we go. So here's a another close-up shot of some of the antenatums. And you can see the nice green petals and with the nice veining in the lip. Okay, you're watering. All these different types of spatulatas do require certain watering technique. But for most part, as long as you don't overwater them, you won't kill them. So if you water them too much and get carried away, or you leave them out in the rain and it gets drenched, and the roots stay too wet too long, it's going to rot. So water thoroughly, and then every two to three days, unless you have you know wet type of media, then you got to adjust your watering. Okay. Canaculatum. Canaculatum is a very nice little plant, also very, very compact. You might want to buy some of these if you can get a hold of them. They like even brighter light than antenatums. They can be found growing in trees and branches and rocks. A lot of them were found in Australia. So they can tolerate very high heat and very bright light. Okay. I have quite a few that are hybrids using uh, canaculatum and other crosses and they, they produce nice sometimes very sturdy inflorescence and a lot of little flowers. It's amazing how much little flowers these plants can hold. So they like good watering, but they like their roots to dry out quickly. They are a type that has very fine roots. You can fertilize quite often, but they don't like to stay in, in a soggy mix and stay wet too long. So watching the watering is important with them also. Airflow, with your plants, you always wanna provide good airflow around the plants. That helps keep them healthy, keeps them cool, reduces the insect population around your plants. And of course, good airflow circulation through the root system gives you very healthy roots. So a lot of you know what I'm talking about, those that don't, if you have a pot with lots of holes and your media is quite large, uh, filling up some gaps, that allows a lot of airflow, even if you think it's in a pot, it still has the tendency to pass air or oxygen through the root system, which helps make the root system very happy. Nice green root tips, nice white filament of the roots is a happy root system. Here is one of my dendrobium discolors. I got this from a friend a long time ago. Very large, very fast growing plant. Uh, when it's a little stress, it does have the tendency to throw a lot of aerial cakes, and the aerial cakes tend to bloom the same time as the mother plants blooming. So it's pretty fascinating to see when you see this six inch long cakey growing off of the mother plant and throwing a spike with 12 to 15 flowers of this size is pretty spectacular. I should have showed you guys one of the newest pictures, but it was pretty fabulous. It's just about done blooming right now. So it normally blooms 
from the end of May till the end of July for me. This plant is growing in full sun next to the fence on the south side of my house and it blooms twice a year. So sometimes it'll bloom the end of December, but not a lot. It'll have maybe two or three spikes, but the best blooming time for this color is usually from May to the end of July, sometimes into August. Here are some other discolors. Uh, one of the most popular ones Walter has and a lot of you other folks have is the discolor Bloomfieldii. Bloomfieldii. It's a pure canary yellow like this upper left corner. Spectacular plant. It grows quite tall and throws a lot of nice, vibrant, canary yellow flowers and excellent root system. You can grow this into a nice specimen plant, but understand that you need to give this plant a lot of light. Like you guys saw Walter's plant in the shows, it has a medium green to yellowish green color to the leaves and the canes. Humidity, provide your plants with decent humidity for a lot of these uh, spotulata plants. They come from areas that they grow in forests, near rivers, on cliffs. So they have a pretty humid environment that they grow in. So if you can act or reenact nature in your growing area to provide them with these conditions you'll see how outstanding your plants can become. So if you want to increase the humidity in your greenhouse, say it's a very hot, dry day, one of my tricks is I just spray water under the bench systems all the way through the greenhouse twice, and then that's it. It'll end up raising the humidity within the greenhouse and makes it kind of balmy feel, but yet it's cooler than that extreme dry, dry heat. Okay. And then you want to protect your plants. Put a note here, if you want to protect your plants from the rain, because if you grow outside in strong, heavy rain, or if you're growing in a area that is very wet, like the windward side, you might want to grow these spatulatas in empty pots with maybe a pot upside down inside of a cement pot and just the root system and just tie it or secure it. Here we have Gouldii, very popular plant. Gouldii is found all over the place. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen some nice ones in shows. This one is a beautiful specimen, uh, 832 flowers. So if someone here on the island can grow one like this, you'd be the happiest person around. I would be looking at your plant smiling with my tongue hanging out. <laughs> but Gouldie Eye is used heavily in breeding, makes a lot of good crosses. We'll see some crosses at some of the shows. Uh, one very popular one was uh, Touch of Gold. Uh, Roy Tokunaga then created this using uh, Gouldie Eye and Johannes. And the, the plant is kind of compact growing and very lovely flowers. Here we have one from Jamaica. This plant was fabulous also, 1,088 flowers. That's amazing. I have one and maybe I'll get 150 at the most. But this plant also likes bright light, uh, can be kind of finicky. So you got to watch the root system because it does have a slight rest period where there's no main uh, root activity. So watching the root system is another key on these plants and making sure that they're in their active growth. And you'll see the 
Goldie Eye likes extreme bright light, so 3,000 to 4,000. Uh, temperature range on this is quite warm also, 82 to 85 degrees, with the nighttime temperatures dropping down in the low 70s to mid-60s. Also likes high humidity condition. So anytime you can reenact its growing conditions in nature, you'll see how good your plants can become. So here's the plant I was talking about, Touch of Gold. It's Gouldie Eye with Johannes. And the flowers are very small. Inflorescent holds itself pretty well. And the color is just spectacular. I have about eight of these plants hanging around in the nursery, in the greenhouse. Tangerinum. Here we have a picture of one of my awarded plants. This is Tangerinum. I think it was Ivalani, I named it after Sheila. A uh, couple awards. It's a finicky plant also, uh, compact growing. Flowers are very vibrant orange. Uh, they can range from this one on the right upper corner to the lower left corner, which has kind of a more brownish tinge. Uh, I hang mines in baskets, plastic baskets, the net type, with very little media. One of them is just bare root in the basket, and I water it every other day because of that. So if you want to do cultural with these species in empty pots, just realize that you're going to have to water a little more frequently to keep the roots moist, not dried out and crispy. Uh, also with this tangerinum, it blooms usually in uh, the end of February through March to April. Normally my plant is blooming during that time for like the windward show and sometimes late or early October for the Honolulu show. So another nice plant to have that blooms twice a year. It likes bright light. Like I say, I, I hang mines in baskets, so they're hanging up high in the greenhouse, so they have maximum light. And almost all my plants get watered every two to three days, depending on the conditions in Makakilo. Here we have several different color variations of Helix. Helix is a quite large growing plant. I like Helix a lot also because of its color and shape and most of them their inflorescence are very erect and hold themselves well so the flowers is not all drooping over and it presents themselves really well it's like hey look at me so this is another good plant to have uh, they do grow quite tall i think the biggest one is about five feet tall almost six feet tall. So these I can't really transport to shows, but you can see these color variations. Uh, this one here on the lower right corner, I have one from Ed Oka. It was his dad's plant way back. And when Ed brought this plant to one of the IAEA meetings, he was speaking on some I think it was about Helix and his father's collection and his collection. And I kept hounding him about this plant. So a few years back, maybe about five, six years back, Ed was on island and he brought me a plant to a meeting. He said, here, grow this plant and grow them good because it grows tall. And sure enough, it grows taller, right? It grew almost to my roof overhang the eaves, so that's about eight feet tall. And the flowers look just like this. It has that yellowish pin striping along the edge of the petals and sepals. So very attractive flower, but uh, still trying to get it to bloom again. I moved it and it hasn't bloomed for about two years now. But Helix likes very bright light. 
very nice colorations as you can see you water every two to three days uh, what else important about this plant it makes excellent hybrids when used for breeding some of them are sterile but most of them do breed so you can try and create your own or ask and I might have some or Roy Tokunaga might still have some around. Here is some of my plants in the backyard. This was a kind of old picture so I didn't take any new ones because me and Sheila worked so hard to clear this area out and make it our barbecue area again and our relaxed area. So it looks different but you can see it's growing under pretty bright conditions. The veranda is slatted like a slatted greenhouse and it has uh, clear polycarbonate down the center and then the smoke gray polycarbonate on the ends. And then of course you can see the, the green shade cloth which is about 60% shade. So temperature for almost all of these plants, they can handle ranges during the day from 80 to 90 degrees. Uh, nighttime temperatures can be from 80 all the way down to the low 60s with a few of them able to handle in the 50 degree range. So some of them are found growing at, at higher altitudes in New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. So they can tolerate pretty cold temperatures. So you always should provide, like I say, a good airflow to prevent the plants from overheating. Here's a few of the hybrids that are used, or uh, that was using some of these uh, spatulata crosses. Nifred timeri is uh, used terrinum and samurai was used to create that plant. So it has a nice wide open lip, nice color, uh, doesn't bloom very well. This is a, a weird cross from uh, Peter Neifert. He gave me many, many years ago, many years ago. And it blooms every once in a while, but only like six to eight flowers at the most. But nice color and shape. Uh, Autumn Twist was one of Roy Tokunaga's them crosses way back in the day. I think it was Autumn Lace with, uh, forget the other cross, sorry. But that was a very nice plant. Compact growing, growing in an empty basket, all roots, and blooms multiple times a year. So some of these, by using good, uh, Watch a lot of plants, they're able to create these outstanding flowers. Uh, Laura Mortimer, that's uh, Stratiotis by, you remember Mel, what was, I forget, Stratiotis and something. But it puts out outstanding presentation. The flowers hold themselves really well on their inflorescent and very large. I even have a kind of, I wouldn't call it alba form, almost alba form. It's all white with green. There's no uh, pink in the lip and it's extremely large flower. Looks kind of like Mel's Stratiotis that he had in the IAS show, but it's a uh, Laura Mortimer, I guess maybe from either George Ota out in Waianae or someone uh, remade the hybrid way back. Okay, pot selection. You want to select the pots that best fit your root system. A lot of times you hear that the dendrobiums like to be potted tightly. Uh, most of mines are not really that tight in the pot. I like to give them a lot of space to grow because me working, I don't have a lot of time for transplanting every year or every two years. So some of them are growing in pots a little larger than they should be. But if the root system is good, 
and you're watering properly, uh, there shouldn't be an issue of root rot because it can provide them with a lot of airflow. So of course, there's a lot of pots out there that you can select different varieties for good drainage. You always want to find something with good drainage, like these pots here. Uh, providing a lot of holes prevents the media from getting rotten and sour. So you use these pots to help you. Because if you use the, the cheaper brand pots with only like one or two, or maybe four holes at the bottom, it's not going to drain very well. It's not going to allow good airflow. You always want to provide it good airflow. Here on the right, you see this lineally impact. Uh, this one was from the mainland. I forget what state. But it has 1,755 flowers. I was able to see a plant maybe twice this size in real life at uh, RF Orchids in Miami at Robert Fuchs place growing in their yard. It's just in their garden. They have this huge pond in the backyard and this massive lineally plant is just smiling there in the yard. And I was like, oh, I went over there and Sheila said, you can't take that plant, that thing. Is. The only thing with some of these linealis that you'll find a, not really a fatal flaw, but a flaw in some of them that they have excessive gaps in their inflorescence. So from, from, Flower to flower, that flower brack on the inflorescent is quite gappy. So there's a lot of space. But if you get a good uh, spatula, uh, spatulata lineale uh, that has really close flowers, nice inflorescence, you got to keep that because they're kind of hard to come by. A lot of them are spaced out quite, quite badly. So here are some of the color variations that you would see. The real blue on the right is the best color form you probably could find. It has excellent, vibrant color in the veining and the lip and also in the petals. And the other two is more the kind of whitish. The other one, that yellow, I don't I haven't seen a, a really yellowish green or a chartreuse lineally. It's mainly this white and that blue, but beautiful plant to have. Excellent plant to be growing out in your yard if you want to grow something in the yard as a decorative piece. It likes bright light, uh, kind of humid conditions, but not too, too humid. So really nice. Uh, media. When you're selecting your media for these plants, you want to provide a media that can give them good aeration around the root. So using larger bark with either a uh, large perlite, uh, they call them the giant, giant perlite. They're white rocks. Or like me, I use these hydrotan expanded clay balls you buy at the hydroponic stores. They're quite hard to come by at times because they come all the way from Germany. So sometimes you can't find them. You gotta just ask. And when it comes in, tell them to give you a call. Uh, they range anywhere from $45 a bag. So it's quite expensive, but I like to use them for my plants that I, I tend to keep because I don't have to transplant as often. But you want to make sure that your media also is good for your area. So if you're a heavy water type of person, you don't want to overwater your spatulatas because this media might stay too soggy. So select the right media that is best for your growing conditions, not Roy's growing conditions. Because in Makakilo, is pretty hot and dry. I do have... Uh, pretty excellent airflow at times, but when we do have Kona winds, it's a totally different environment 
on the opposite side of the house. So watering conditions totally change. The south side of the house, you have the cooler Kona wind. The northwest side of my house will be balmy, humid. Uh, two days ago, the plants didn't even dry out. They were still wet and kind of damp the media till almost four o'clock in the afternoon. So you got to select the right media for your growing conditions. A lot of people, or even me, I use like bark mix in cement pots for my larger plants. And then I'll top dress the pot with some bark. The bark on top is to prevent the overheating of the rocks. Because if you have these plants in really, really bright light, the rocks will be like an emu and start cooking the roots. So you want to make sure you top dress the blue rock if you're going to use that for growing. You can see here's a Lacentera, another beautiful plant, very large growing, likes bright light, but it likes very, very humid conditions. So anywhere from 80 to 95% humidity. So these are found growing, <clears throat> excuse me, These are found growing near swamps and mangrove jungles and some near the ocean. So they get a lot of salt spray and real balmy, humid conditions. So uh, with the media, you want to have something that stays kind of moist, but not too wet with these lesson terrors. And here are the rest of them. As you can see how beautiful the colors of the petals, the sepals, even the lip. Uh, I got to see some spectacular Lassenteros when we went to Japan at the Tokyo Dome show. A lot of the guys from Malaysia and Singapore create a lot of these species by breeding different Lacentera uh, color forms and look for their spectacular upright inflorescence because these flowers always look down. If you see these plants in real life, they're always kind of sad looking downward. But these guys in Singapore and Malaysia are breeding this out of them. And a lot of the inflorescence now are upright Flowers are almost looking straight at you and they have beautiful color variations. Stratiotis is a beautiful plant. This was Wally uh, Nakamura's plant way back in the early days. This one was from 2004, highly awardable plant. And Mel Waukee has some beautiful Stratiotis. Someday I'll have one growing as beautiful as his was. Uh, these are excellent plants to have. They're very robust, kind of finicky growers though. You gotta watch these, these plants like to jump pot also. They, they're like creepers or crawlers. They don't stay in the pot. I have one from Curtis. It likes to creep out of the net pot and going outside. So I got to put them deeper in the pot to prevent them from trying to go outside. So that's one kind of trick with these stratiotis. You got to plant them a little deeper in the pot so they're trapped and they cannot climb out. Acclimating, you want to grow your beautiful dendrobiums out in the sun. You want to acclimate them slowly. I have quite a few that are growing out in full sunlight. The only shade they get is as the sun is setting from the houses next door. But when the sun is up, they have full sunlight. So 
So you got to do it slowly. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the best times to do this is in the cooler months. So you start doing it maybe late November. Uh, if it's a rainy type time of the year, then you got to watch the rain. But you slowly acclimate them, you put them out a couple hours, bring them back into somewhat shade, put them out a couple hours and, and slowly adjust them. After a while, they'll be able to just withstand full sun and they look spectacular because they'll bloom their best when they're just grown out in nature. So here we have Mel's plant. As you can see how beautiful the presentations are on the flowers, very upright, very well grown. And this plant is just spectacular. So he got several awards. This is the old awards from a few years back. Uh, the newest awards was way higher. He had FCC and a high AM. So awesome job. Uh, very spectacular, as you can see. So fertilizing, a lot of you ask questions about fertilizing. I do fertilize every week. Uh, Weak concentration, so anywhere from half teaspoon to one. That's because my plants are quite large. Uh, smaller plants and other orchids get less. They get one fourth to half most of the time. But the large dendrobiums can take up to one teaspoon per gallon. So like the saying goes, weekly, weekly, you fertilize weak. If you fertilize more frequently, you reduce the amount of fertilizer you use down to one fourth if you're watering and fertilizing every two to three days. So like at the nurseries, that's what the nurseries do. They're watering every time and then they fertilize every watering yeah but they're feeding at this a lower rate on mine uh dendrobiums a lot of them i find that they like excellent fertilizers and high in calcium and magnesium so if you're using a fertilizer that does not contain high calcium or magnesium. That would be a fertilizer like 10, 30, 20. Uh, the Peters bloom something. That doesn't have calcium or magnesium because of the high phosphate and potassium in the fertilizer. Calcium and magnesium doesn't mix well with that types. They'll, uh, create like a cloud or lockout, fertilizer lockout, because the two chemical compounds do not mix well. And then it'll turn your fertilizer mix into this cloudy, spoiled milk looking mixture. So never mix the two together. So if you're using Michigan, the Michigan State fertilizer, excellent choice. Very high calcium, very high magnesium based fertilizer. Also, you can add Epsom salt on alternate times, maybe a tablespoon per gallon. Mix well in warm water prior to applying on your plants. And that helps also with good healthy root system. I do tend to use Super Thrive once a month at one eighth of a teaspoon. So that's the smallest little measuring spoon you have to three gallons of water. So like Super Thrive, normally you put one to three drops per gallon. My fertilizer mix goes for each batch is a six gallon batch. So fertilizing is important, just like our vitamins that we take, nutrition, extra supplements that we take in. Here you see the Peters uh, 10, 30, 20, and then NutriCoat 14, 14, 14. You can use 
the pellet form also if you don't like fertilizing with the water soluble type. You can add these pellets to your pots, sprinkle them around the root system, not just all in the middle. And then just leave them for three to six months. They don't need to be added again till depending on which bag you buy. If it's 120 or the 360 day or whatever it is, follow the directions. Yeah. I haven't used pellet form for a while because I water and fertilize usually on a Saturday or a Sunday, and I use water salable. I do I do change up my fertilizer, like a lot of times you guys hear me. Uh, instead of eating steak or chicken all the time, you change your menu so that you have all these extra nutrients that are not only found in one type of fertilizer because of the mixing of certain things, certain chemical compounds do not mix. So if you like adding stem, a lot of you use this stem product is uh, micronutrients. I use that every once in a while. You need to watch out because if you put too much, you can cause some damage to the plants where you have uh, toxicity poisoning to the plant and you might start dropping leaves or cause other weird things to happen to your plant. So make sure you're using very small amount. Uh, I think it was one eight teaspoon to five or six gallons. So that's very little to a large amount of water. So make sure you don't use too much. Okay, and then when you fertilize, you water all your plants first, come back, and then you fertilize about 10 minutes later. So you let the plant's root system get a little bit wet, absorb some of that water. So when you're applying your fertilizer, which is a, a acidic mix, it doesn't burn the roots. Because when you apply fertilizers, if uh, it's really strong, it will burn the roots and cause uh, browning or turning a weird black coloration. So I learned that the hard way a couple of times, some of the young plants got exposed to too much fertilizer and the roots got burnt. And they look kind of like if you was to take a torch and heat the roots, they have that brown caramelized look to it. Insect control. So with all orchids, you always want to check your plants and make sure you don't have a pest problem. So if you do, you want to know what type of insect you have. So you check the insects, uh, take a picture of them, look them up online and see there's insect guides that you can look at and identify the insect so that you can find the correct chemicals to use and help combat your problem. So for me, I know the insects pretty darn well. I know what kills them, what to use. So I use certain products, but whenever you find an insect issue, of course you need to know what they are, how to kill them, and then their life cycle, because some of them have a very short life cycle. Some of them have a, a little longer life cycle. So you wanna catch them before they lay eggs or babies and then the cycle will not get wiped out okay so use the right chemicals to prevent the spread treat your plants check the area and spray three to five days after your first treatment and then monitor so if you don't see any problems and you're good for a little bit, then you check again and retreat anywhere from seven to 14 days later. If you're using some of these other uh, systemic insecticides, they have a longer contact and uh, what is that word? A internal effect on the plant that stays with the plant for anywhere from uh, 30 days to three months. So the plant becomes a toxic host. 
So if the insect comes to your yard and says, oh yeah, look at all these beautiful orchids and starts nibbling away at any of your plants, they're gonna die. So the plant holds that systemic stuff in them and helps to control insects on a larger, broader band. So if you use bare three in one, like I do, excellent choice. It helps with a lot of problems, uh, insects, mites, and it also has a fungicide in it. Other safer products to use. If you don't like using chemicals and you wanna help protect the environment, we use neem oil, horticulture oil, or insecticidal soap. You can also make your own concoction. We have here at the house, gallon jugs with neem oil mixed inside and some rubbing alcohol. So the 70% rubbing alcohol, we use one whole container of the rubbing alcohol, pour it into the gallon, add water till you almost reach the top. Then you add two tablespoons neem oil and mix them up and you use them as you spray in a spray bottle. And that's pretty effective, but if you have a large amount of plants and a bad infestation, then you have to use stronger chemicals. So Safari, Bear 3-in-1, stuff like that to help knock them down and get rid of them. So here's the products. You see a lot of them on the shelves at the store. Just make sure when you do buy these products, you read the label. Don't just rely on Roy's guidance. You know, I can tell you a lot on chemical usage and protection, but read the labels so you know. Also, slugs. Slugs can be a real problem, especially for you folks that live in the valleys or near the mountains where a lot of rain these slugs like to hide out in the grass. And like I've told you stories before, unfortunately, they don't like to come out during the day. They come out late at night. So you gotta be up at 10.30, 11 o'clock, drinking your coffee, go outside like me with my fishing light on my head, checking around the yard, making sure I don't have slugs. And then when I find them, uh, start saying some bad words and then I skewer them with the hot stainless steel rod to get rid of them. And the next day I'm spreading sluggle or uh, deadline. Uh, deadline is a very harsh product. So don't, I don't recommend you using that around your house if you have pets. Sluggle is safe. We do have dogs, uh, birds. We had a turtle and disappeared but it's a safe product to use around the house. Always wear your PPEs, okay? If you don't have special protective equipment for yourself, uh, those raincoats or PVC uh, raincoat jackets or long sleeve shirt, socks, boots, gloves, always use these product uh, PPEs when you're using these chemical products. So some of them do contain some pretty harsh stuff. And you don't want to get that on your skin or ingest it. So always wash your hands after you're done. Record keeping is very important. So if you can't remember things, you know, we're getting older. Even me, I cannot remember some stuff. I'll just rattle on and it's like, what was this word? I cannot remember. What was this plant? So I have to write things down using either a composition book or putting it in my yearly planner. So I keep track of what I spray, when I sprayed it, what signs I might have saw during the week, if it affected a plant with some chemical that I use, because sometimes I spray uh, fungicide and if it's too strong, certain plants don't like it, the leaves drop. So I got to pay attention to that if I'm mixing the concentration of a certain product. Fertilizing what I, what I mixed when I applied. It's good information because it helps you and guides you to growing better plants. 
if we don't have documentation to learn from or records to show even your, like your pictures, if you take pictures of your plants and you have a problem, hey Roy or Mel, what is this problem I'm having with my plant? You show us a picture, we can kind of help you and guide you in a direction to prevent that from happening again. But with no information, no records, you're walking in the dark growing plants. So you've got to learn and try to keep some information handy. And here's more pictures of my plants. A lot of these are still around. Wai'anae perfusion is still around. The plant is about six feet tall, three feet wide, and blooming right now with about 30 inflorescence. Each inflorescent has anywhere from 15 to 30 flowers. Uh, Mesengale, my old plant from Aiea, still growing. It bloomed itself to death because it bloomed so much, it almost killed itself. So I had to cut the whole plant up to save it because of this blooming itself to death effect. Uh, uh, Burana emerald, the nice vibrant color one you see here in the middle, still growing. It's blooming right now in the front greenhouse near the garage. It has seven spikes, about 30, 30 to 50 flowers right now. Some of them are still in bud. They're not quite open yet. But you can see they're large plants. So you can grow large plants and keep them for many, many years. This Laura Mortimer is still around. This plant back there is about 23 years old, maybe 25 years old. So you can see all the different plants and the growing conditions. We have multiple growing conditions along this back near the green shade clock is the banda growing area. And that area has sprinkler system. It gets watered uh, twice a day, every other day, sometimes three times a day, depending how hot it is in Makakilo. And then we have more plants down from this point of the veranda, about 75 feet down the side of the house with orchids. So some of you already seen my place and know how much plants there is. Here we have a beautiful cross made by exotic orchids of Maui. So exotic twist was used, create, uh, created by using Easter bunny and Gouldii. Very beautiful plant. The flowers are quite large, uh, not very well presented flowers. There are times where the flowers are unevenly spaced, so not very consistent, but very beautiful still. And here we have Christian Lichman, a plant. Uh, Roy Tokunagadem created way back. It's a 4N. He used 4N Antonatum and a 4N Strablosaris to come up with this beautiful plant. Uh, compact growing. Right now it's growing in a six inch, six inch cement pot. Kind of root bound, but the plant has become like a little uh, specimen plant just clustered together and when it gets good light lots of flowers not high flower count it's about six to nine flowers per inflorescent but really nice it has that olive green petals and very nice purple veining in the lip and very well presented on the inflorescence Blue Bees is another plant created by Mike Blitz on Maui. They use Lacentera and Blue Twinkle to create this. So two extremes here. Uh, Lacentera is a very big flower, looking downward, beautiful coloration, very large plant, 
blue twinkle is Canaculatum with Betty Goda. Very small plant, compact growing with this beautiful color flower, kind of that purple tinge. So they cross these two and one of the plants, when you look at the flower, the color of the blue twinkle, but it has the, the shape and the look of the Lacentera with that little downward look. If you see the inflorescence, most of the flowers are looking downward, even though it was staked up early. But beautiful plant, not a whole lot of inflorescence when it blooms. It's growing in a 10 inch cement pot and I think the tallest cane is about four feet tall. But when it does bloom in bright conditions, it's pretty spectacular, the, the flowers look. And here we have Hawaiian Punch, another beautiful creation from HNR Nursery. And it's an awarded plant of mine. It's now gotten so big that I can't move it out of the greenhouse. It's tied to the bench, but it's currently blooming now. And I think there was six, six or seven spikes on the inflorescence. But the flowers are very beautiful, nice purple, vibrant color. Kind of when you look closely at it in the greenhouse, it looks almost like velvet. So I hope you learned quite a bit. If you didn't, and you need more information, you know, you can always contact me via email or send pictures in your email with your questions. And I'm more than happy to help. If you're interested in buying plants or want to come and take a look, let me know also. You would have to wear a mask and limit two to three people only at a time at my place. Hopefully you enjoyed and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roy. You're welcome. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, Roy. Yeah. This is, oh, I'm sorry, Catherine. Do you want to go? Yeah, just a comment that to tune in in September to our next Zoom meeting because Generous Roy is giving away the, the giveaway plants. So if you want some of his uh, spatulatas, you can join us again in September. Thank you, Roy. Yeah, but it won't be my big plants. <laughs> no. <laughs> It'll be small plants, but oh. you'll be able to grow them quick and nice. <laughs> oh, ahead, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Roy, this is Brandon. Um, uh, uh, you know your tanger, tangerino, was it? Yeah, tangerino. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you have any, any for sale? Like anyone, like a small one for sale? Or are you gonna give it away next month? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a nice it, one. Yeah, that one unfortunately yeah. is not for sale. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. Unless, unless you get yep. a couple thousand dollars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah okay uh, uh i'm out <laughs> no, that plant is not for sale but i have some that roy roy tokunaga used a tangerinum and made some crosses with and they will be some of the plants in the giveaway okay uh do you know who sells that tangerino is it does um, roy have no roy i don't think roy has straight tangerinum you can try check he might have or you okay can, uh Later on, email me and then I'll, I'll look yeah. up if anyone oh. on Big Island oh. might still have some. Oh. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. You're welcome. Any you're right. how, come, uh, how come you're not making any crosses yourself? It seems like you have uh, quite a collection of good stock plants to do some breeding. Yeah, I am now. I've been working on trying to breed some. Some of them, they don't take. Uh, still trying to figure out if 
the pollination time should be early morning or at night. Because I've, I've been trying with that, uh, what you call, Maui, Maui sparkle, the one you want pollen from. Oh. <laughs> and I pollinated it a couple days ago. Looked like it took, and then the flower fell off. So I know it's it's not accepting. So it may be wrong timing. A lot of breeders or hybridizers say it, sometimes it's the timing. If you pollinate too late in the blooming cycle, it might not take. But I did make a few crosses that I gave uh, seeds to Margaret to germinate. And I think she might still have one of them from that cross. But I, I'm trying well. I've, yeah, I've been good. working on some. Especially when you're so young, you're less than, less than 30, right? Yeah, 37. Do <laughs> 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 you have Torinum in your collection? Yeah, I cannot disclose that information. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have one, That's but beautiful uh, plant. Yeah, the terinum is beautiful. I have, uh, I do have one, and uh, nin nindii, the other one that looks almost like terinum, but it's very, very hard to grow. It's very oh. finicky. Well, you know, Edwin's father, uh, Teruoka, used to use uh, Torinum in his uh, breeding line. And he yes. made some really beautiful crosses. Yeah, that's why. Torinum, that... Torinum is a very hard plant to keep alive. Yes, and it can grow very tall, too. Right, right. But it is an excellent uh, use for breeding because of the color and that shape. So I thought I had a picture. I think it was in the other presentation that gave me problems and crashed. I had more of my actual plants from the yard in that presentation, but for some reason, PowerPoint had a glitch. And when I tried to give that presentation at one of the meetings, it wouldn't work. So I had to go to fallback training and Jan kind of knows I was stressing trying to get this thing put together and get powerpoint working again but well you know mel you see me do <laughs> presentation at ia with no powerpoint and just shoot from the hip just as good yeah any other questions well if you have to read them you should self that yeah i want your uh Ma Mahilani. You're getting better at using Mahilani? your thing. Using the buttons. Yeah, huh? I, I think it's something wrong with the PowerPoint. So I redid the program, bought one new program, and still it had a glitch uh, the other day. But yeah, I'm going to continue trying to make hybrids using some of the plants that Roy sold to me and some that he gave me and hopefully create some new stuff. Any other questions? No? Wow, no questions. I need some challenges. <laughs> Roy. Yes. Do you need to treat the water to get better results? Right. I mean, I get the minerals out of it? Yeah, some of, sometimes our city water is, is not good for the plants. Because here in Makakilo, we come off of I think some of the wells from Kunia and they go through a real high tech water treatment facility, but the water tends to have a lot of chlorides because sometimes I can be taking a shower and it's like, wow, what is all that smell from the water? And then I'll take a sample to work and test the water. And sure enough, the chlorides is kind of high because maybe they switching 
their water treatment vessels because they go through these uh, filtering systems and uh, charcoal carbon vessels and so forth. And you can notice it in the plants. Sometimes if there's too much stuff in the water, the leaves drop. You'll see some of the plants start turning yellow, the dendrobins for no reason. It's like, what's going on? How come the leaves dropping? And then if I check back, it's like, oh yeah, a couple of weeks ago, the water tests at work showed high chlorides. <clears throat> so using rainwater, if you can capture, or if you can afford RO system, that's great. But rainwater is probably the best, but it's you know kind of scarce for most of us nowadays, unless you live close to the mountain. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Roy, this is Sandy. I have a question for you. If yeah. you're alternating tap water and rainwater. Yeah, that's when, fine. If you're alternating. Okay, but when should you, which one should you use your fertilizer with? I would use the rainwater. Okay. And just flush the plant with the tap yeah. water. Yeah, and using the tap water for like your flushing. Because <clears throat> the tap water, you're going to use more water than the rainwater. So using the tap water as your leaching water or your flush. So say every so often you're going to do your flush <clears throat> to wash out all the salts and fertilizer, you would use the city water versus wasting the rainwater as your flush. <clears throat> okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so if anybody's interested, you know, just let me know. You wanna come take a look at plants or maybe buy some. I get quite a few, some are quite large plants and Anything is for sale except my tangerinum. <laughs> oh, and a few other breeding plants. Would you share your contact information so they could call you or? Oh, we went off on you. Oh, uh, maybe not my <laughs> phone number, but you can have my email, Eva. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the email. Eva Orchid Society at yahoo.com. Him about the bugs, you're on. Hey, Roy. Yeah. Hey, what kind of bugs get? What is the most common? What get like spider mites for yeah. orchids? What's the most common thing you see? Spider mites for dendrobiums. They like to attack dendrobiums. Spider mites and trips. Trips too, yeah. Yeah. What you guys using for the trips? Like spinosads or what? Some. Yeah. Yeah. You can use that or safari. Safari. What is that? Like um, bifidian or something. Oh, that's yeah. a culprit. It's a systemic. A systemic? It'll, yeah, it'll work through the plant and kill them. Okay, oh, that's safari. That's yeah, that one, sometimes you can find it at Kolau Farmers or Sim... Uh, Sim oh, oh, that's the one, Safer. I just like that is how they spell them, right? Saf safari. S -A -S yeah, it's, it's spelled safari. It's a white container. Hmm. And what about yeah. water pH matter or what? When, when the kind. Yeah, you like the pH of the water more in the range of six to six and a half. Well, see right there. For best best uptake. Tap, tap is like seven, huh? Yeah, our tap up here is seven two to seven five. Marker you need to set up on fertigation system to dosers and and pump the fertilizer through. So. Yeah, can. Can. Yep. So what would be the mix then? What, what, what's, what's a weak mix to pump through? Depending on what dosatron system you're using. Get, you all, get all ratios down top. You can go. Yeah, you just got to look at the ratio and see if 
uh, one to four hundred, or depending, because I'm not sure what that dosatron if you're using the four hundred or larger. The thing range from one percent to four yeah, percent. They have one scale that you adjust that black dial. Yeah, and it'll extract the right amount of fertilizer for that given ratio. Well, I get I get ten thirty twenty. You know, I just try to think of a stock mixture. I don't know what would yeah. be. just be weak then. Yeah, maybe like one fourth to half. Half the EC. Like, well, what the EC come out? Uh, not sure on that one. Yeah, but like the PPMs. I think mine's PPMs was twelve to fourteen thirty. I think that's like EC two then. Uh. Yeah, okay. total dissolved solids with nitrogen at that. Yeah, I kind of remember the total dissolved solid numbers, but you got to watch if you don't want them too high because you're going to burn the plants there. Yeah. Not too high, you think? Yeah, bet, better on the low side. Thousand is good enough, yeah. Yeah, thousand to twelve hundred. All right, I check, you know, let your stuff grow. Huh? I'm going to try to hook up the, the sprayers. Huh? So, <laughs> let me take care. <laughs> what else questions I get? I don't know. I had a All right. Okay, any further questions for Roy? No. Nope. Roy, right. one last question. Go ahead. Uh, if you had to pick up one of your dendrobiums to grow in a hanging net pot so it be have to be kind of small and compact and what would that be any of my antenatum crosses uh if, if, do you have any that are like small enough to grow in a hanging net pot where oh, yeah. the yeah. pot wouldn't turn sideways under the weight no, no. i get quite a quite a bit of small spatulata type hybrids that are in net pots hanging up in the greenhouse and maybe 15, 15 to 18 inches tall. Yeah, too bad no more enough light outside. I could show you, show you folks the live plants probably. Maybe we can do another training another year, like how Walter's one. Well, walk through the garden and I could show you and explain all kinds of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So they, they grow well for you then, some of them, the small kind, net oh, pot, yeah. bare root. Yeah. Quite a, quite a bit of them, even some that grow quite large. As long as you stake them up and tie them to the, the hangers and you get them the right size hanger for the size of the plant, because if not, it'll touch your greenhouse roof. If you know, pay attention, eh? they grow so fast, but they do well, especially the, the ones with canaculatum in them. They have more fine roots yes. and they stay very compact growing. Thank you. Canaculatum. Yeah. Just remember. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, you know, the um the pots that you're showing the hanging basket and the, the net pots and also there's the pot that looks like the one gallon on the yeah. left yes. but where can we because um somebody in the in my complex actually gave me pots like that but i don't know where they got it from do you know where i can koala farmers koala oh i never seen those i never seen the one yeah, maybe they're out of yep. stock, but usually it's on the back shelf. There's a yep. whole bunch of them there. Okay. Oh, which, which one you, you you go to? I mean, you saw that. Uh, town one. What is that? Baratania? Town. Okay. Oh, Baratania. Okay. Okay. If not, I'll go try ask. ask yeah. yeah. Just ask the guy. Because I mean, normally they get plenty hanging in the back corner where yep. all those uh, wooden, yep. the wooden benches or the wooden planter boxes. Oh yeah, correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Sounds good. Okay, well, thank you, Roy. We really enjoyed your presentation, gave us a lot of ideas, and the pictures are great examples of the wide variety of dendrobium spatulata. Um, 